Introduction to Genji Monogatari. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Moira Fogarty. Genji Monogatari by Murasaki Shikibu. Translated by Suyamatsu Kencho. Introduction. Genji Monogatari, the original of this translation, is one of the standard works of Japanese literature. It has been regarded for centuries as a national treasure. The title of the work is by no means unknown to those Europeans who take an interest in Japanese matters, for it is mentioned or alluded to in almost every European work relating to our country. It was written by a lady who, from her writings, is considered one of the most talented women that Japan has ever produced. She was the daughter of Fujiwara Tametoki, a petty court noble, remotely connected with the great family of Fujiwara, in the tenth century after Christ, and was generally called Murasaki Shikibu. About these names a few remarks are necessary. The word Shikibu means ceremonies, and is more properly a name adopted, with the addition of certain suffixes, to designate special court offices. Thus the term Shikibkyo is synonymous with Master of the Ceremonies, and Shikib no Dio with secretary to the master of the ceremonies. Hence it might at first sight appear rather peculiar if such an appellation should happen to be used as the name of a woman. It was, however, a custom of the period for noble ladies and their attendants to be often called after such offices, generally with the suffix no kata, indicating the female sex, and somewhat corresponding to the word madam. This probably originated in the same way as the practice in America of calling ladies by their husbands' official titles, such as Mrs. Captain, Mrs. Judge, etc., only that, in the case of the Japanese custom, the official title came in time to be used without any immediate association with the offices themselves, and often even as a maiden name. From this custom our authoress came to be called Shikibu, a name which did not originally apply to a person. To this, another name, Murasaki, was added, in order to distinguish her from other ladies who may also have been called Shikibu. Murasaki means violet, whether the flower or the color. Concerning the origin of this appellation, there exist two different opinions. Those holding one derive it from her family name, Fujiwara, for Fujiwara literally means the field of wisteria, and the color of the wisteria blossom is violet. Those holding the other trace it to the fact that out of several persons introduced into the story, Violet, Murasaki in the text, is a most modest and gentle woman. Whence it is thought that the admirers of the work transferred the name to the authoress herself. In her youth she was maid of honor to a daughter of the then Prime Minister, who became eventually the wife of the Emperor Ichijio, better known by her surname Giotto Monin and who is especially famous as having been the patroness of our authoress. Murasaki Shikib married a noble named Nobtaka, to whom she bore a daughter, who herself wrote a work of fiction called Sagoromo, Narrow Sleeves. She survived her husband, Nobtaka, some years, and spent her latter days in quiet retirement, dying in the year 992 after Christ. The diary which she wrote during her retirement is still in existence, and her tomb may yet be seen in a Buddhist temple in Kyoto, the old capital where the principal scenes of her story are laid. The exact date when her story was written is not given in the work, but her diary proves that it was evidently composed before she arrived at old age. The traditional account given of the circumstances which preceded the writing of the story is this. When the above-mentioned empress was asked by the Saigu, the sacred virgin of the temple of Ise, if Her Majesty could not procure an interesting romance for her, because the older fictions had become too familiar, she requested Shikibu to write a new one, and the result of this request was this story. The tradition goes on to say that when this request was made, Shikibu retired to the Buddhist temple in Ishiyama, situated on hilly ground at the head of the picturesque river Wuji, looking down on Lake Biwa. There she betook herself to undergo the Tuya, confinement in a temple throughout the night. 
a solemn religious observance for the purpose of obtaining divine help and good success in her undertaking. It was the evening of the 15th of August. Before her eyes the view extended for miles. In the silver lake below, the pale face of the full moon was reflected in the calm, mirror-like waters, displaying itself in indescribable beauty. Her mind became more and more serene as she gazed on the prospect before her, while her imagination became more and more lively as she grew calmer and calmer. The ideas and incidents of the story which she was about to write stole into her mind as if by divine influence. The first topic which struck her most strongly was that given in the chapters on exile. These she wrote down immediately, in order not to allow the inspiration of the moment to be lost, on the back of a roll of Daihanya, the Chinese translation of Mahabrajna Paramita, one of the Buddhist sutras, and formed subsequently two chapters in the text, the Summa and Akashi, all the remaining parts of the work having been added one by one. It is said that this idea of exile came naturally to her mind, because a prince who had been known to her from her childhood had been in exile at Kyushu a little before this period. It is also said that the authoress afterwards copied the role of Daihanya with her own hand, in expiation of her having profanely used it as a notebook, and that she dedicated it to the temple, in which there is still a room where she is alleged to have written down the story. A roll of Daihanya is there also, which is asserted to be the very same one copied by her. How far these traditions are in accordance with fact may be a matter of question, but thus they have come down to us and are popularly believed. Many Europeans, I dare say, have noticed on our lacquer work and other art objects the representation of a lady seated at a writing desk with a pen held in her tiny fingers, gazing at the moon reflected in a lake. This lady is no other than our authoress. The number of chapters in the modern text of the story is fifty-four, one of these having the title only and nothing else. There is some reason to believe that there might have existed a few additional chapters. Of these fifty-four chapters, the first forty-one relate to the life and adventures of Prince Genji, and those which come after refer principally to one of his sons. The last ten are supposed to have been added by another hand, generally presumed to have been that of her daughter. This is conjectured because the style of these final chapters is somewhat dissimilar to that of those which precede. The period of time covered by the entire story is some sixty years, and this volume of translation comprises the first seventeen chapters. The aims which the authoress seems always to have kept in view are revealed to us at some length by the mouth of her hero. Ordinary histories, he is made to say, are the mere records of events, and are generally treated in a one-sided manner. They give no insight into the true state of society. This, however, is the very sphere on which romances principally dwell. Romances, he continues, are indeed fictions, but they are by no means always pure inventions, their only peculiarities being these, that in them the writers often trace out, among numerous real characters, the best, when they wish to represent the good, and the oddest when they wish to amuse. From these remarks we can plainly see that our authoress fully understood the true vocation of a romance writer, and has successfully realized the conception in her writings. The period to which her story relates is supposed to be the earlier part of the tenth century after Christ, a time contemporary with her own life. Our country had made a signal progress in civilization by its own internal development, and by the external influence of the Enlightenment of China, with whom we had had for some time considerable intercourse. No country could have been happier than was ours at this epoch. It enjoyed perfect tranquillity, being alike free from all fears of foreign invasion and domestic commotions. Such a state of things, however, could not continue long without producing some evils, and we can hardly be surprised to find that the imperial capital became a sort of center of comparative luxury and idleness. Society lost sight, to a great extent, of true morality, and the effeminacy of the people constituted the chief feature of the age. Men were ever ready to carry on sentimental adventures whenever they found opportunities, and the ladies of the time were not disposed to disencourage them altogether. 
The court was the focus of society, and the utmost ambition of ladies of some birth was to be introduced there. As to the state of politics, the emperor, it is true, reigned, but all the real power was monopolized by members of the Fujiwara families. These, again, vied among themselves for the possession of this power, and their daughters were generally used as political instruments, since almost all the royal consorts were taken from some of these families. The abdication of an emperor was a common event, and arose chiefly from the intrigues of these same families, although partly from the prevailing influence of Buddhism over the public mind. Such, then, was the condition of society at the time when the authoress, Murasaki Shikibu, lived, and such was the sphere of her labors, a description of which she was destined to hand down to posterity by her writings. In fact, there is no better history than her story, which so vividly illustrates the society of her time. True it is that she openly declares in one passage of her story that politics are not matters which women are supposed to understand. Yet, when we carefully study her writings, we can scarcely fail to recognize her work as a partly political one. This fact becomes more vividly interesting when we consider that the unsatisfactory conditions of both the state and society soon brought about a grievous weakening of the imperial authority, and opened wide the gate for the ascendancy of the military class. This was followed by the systematic formation of feudalism, which, for some seven centuries, totally changed the face of Japan. For from the first ascendancy of this military system, down to our own days, Everything in society, ambitions, honors, the very temperament and daily pursuits of men, and political institutes themselves, became thoroughly unlike those of which our authoress was an eye-witness. I may almost say that for several centuries Japan never recovered the ancient civilization which she had once attained and lost. Another merit of the work consists in its having been written in pure classical Japanese, and here it may be mentioned that we had once made a remarkable progress in our own language, quite independently of any foreign influence, and that when the native literature was at first founded, its language was identical with that spoken. Though the predominance of Chinese studies had arrested the progress of the native literature, it was still extant at the time, and even for some time after the date of our authoress. But with the ascendancy of the military class, the neglect of all literature became for centuries universal. The little that has been preserved is an almost unreadable chaos of mixed Chinese and Japanese. Thus a gulf gradually opened between the spoken and the written language. It has been only during the last 250 years that our country has once more enjoyed a long continuance of peace, and has once more renewed its interest in literature. Still, Chinese has occupied the front rank, and almost monopolized attention. It is true that within the last sixty or seventy years, numerous works of fiction of different schools have been produced, mostly in the native language, and that these, when judged as stories, generally excel in their plots, those of the classical period. The status, however, of these writers has never been recognized by the public, nor have they enjoyed the same degree of honor as scholars of a different description. Their style of composition, moreover, has never reached the same degree of refinement which distinguished the ancient works. This last is a strong reason for our appreciation of true classical works such as that of our authoress. Again, the concise description of scenery, the elegance of which it is almost impossible to render with due force in another language, and the true and delicate touches of human nature which everywhere abound in the work, especially in the long dialogue in chapter 2, are almost marvellous when we consider the sex of the writer and the earlier period when she wrote. Yet this work affords fair ground for criticism. The thread of her story is often diffuse and somewhat disjointed, a fault probably due to the fact that she had more flights of imagination than power of equal and systematic condensation, she having been often carried away by that imagination from points where she ought to have rested. But, on the other hand, in most parts the dialogue is scanty, which might have been prolonged to considerable advantage, if it had been framed on models of modern composition. The work also is too voluminous. In translating, I have cut out several passages which appeared superfluous, 
though nothing has been added to the original. The authoress has been by no means exact in following the order of dates, though this appears to have proceeded from her endeavor to complete each distinctive group of ideas in each particular chapter. In fact, she had even left the chapters unnumbered, simply contenting herself with a brief heading, after which each is now called, such as chapter Kiritsubo, etc., so that the numbering has been undertaken by the translator for the convenience of the reader. It has no extraordinarily intricate plot like those which excite the readers of the sensational romances of the modern Western style. It has many heroines, but only one hero, and this comes, no doubt, from the peculiar purpose of the writer, to portray different varieties and shades of female characters at once, as is shadowed in chapter 2, and also to display the intense fickleness and selfishness of man. I notice these points beforehand in order to prepare the reader for the more salient faults of the work. On the whole, my principal object is not so much to amuse my readers as to present them with a study of human nature, and to give them information on the history of the social and political condition of my native country nearly a thousand years ago. They will be able to compare it with the condition of medieval and modern Europe. Another peculiarity of the work to which I would draw attention is that, with a few exceptions, it does not give proper names to the personages introduced. For the male characters, official titles are generally employed, and to the principal female ones, some appellation taken from an incident belonging to the history of each. For instance, a girl is named Violet because the hero once compared her to that flower, while another is called Yugao because she was found in a humble dwelling where the flowers of the Yugao covered the hedges with a mantle of blossom. I have now only to add that the translation is, perhaps, not always idiomatic, though in this matter I have availed myself of some valuable assistance, for which I feel most thankful. Suyamatsu Kenshio, Tokyo, Japan End of Introduction Recording by Moira Fogarty, Toronto, Canada June 2008